Hey everyone, welcome to our weekly webinar. I'm Kathy Fedke, co-founder and co-CEO of Real Wealth Network. And it's great to see you kind of, I, I actually can't see you at all, but I feel like um, somehow we're together. So <laughs> it's great. It's been an interesting year and maybe we'll have a live event sometime in soon, maybe January, we'll see. In the meantime, uh, we are going to be talking about syndications, passive investing with real estate syndications. I'm going to start in just a few minutes. I want to make sure everybody gets a chance to, to get on here. Um, I'll give a little history of our um, experience with syndications that in two, let's see, I think it was 2009, just when the market was really just crashing. It was in a free fall, scary times, uh, which is, oh my gosh, almost 12 years ago now. It's amazing. It feels like yesterday, but 2009 was a very terrifying year to be in real estate and to be any, anywhere um, the economy worldwide had um, come crashing down. And uh, that left an incredible opportunity to buy distressed assets for very, very cheap. But you couldn't walk into a bank and get the money to buy those assets because maybe they had issues with them. You know, foreclosures might might have, you know, had missing items that a bank wouldn't lend on. They certainly don't lend on stuff you buy at the auctions. So there was this need for capital and the banks weren't providing it. And before 2009, capital was pretty freely given uh, if it had, if you had anything to do with real estate, whether you were a builder, uh, buying land, um, you know, certainly buying houses, there was unlimited loans, unlimited loans that you could get for investment property. I mean, it was really quite the uh, exciting times if you knew how to use leverage and you did it properly. A lot of people uh, borrowed too much at that time. There was a lot of uh, confidence. So... Before 2009, there wasn't a huge need for syndication. Some people were still doing it, but it wasn't as common as it is today because you could just walk into a bank and get much cheaper money, much easier, maybe in the five, six percent range, maybe less. Uh, so it just depended. There, there was an abundance of capital. And, um, and then when that disappeared and banks started to fail, in 2009, uh, you obviously we know that lending what became very, very, very tight, very strict, and builders couldn't just go out and you know go to a bank and get money. In fact, even investors couldn't. It was pretty tough. So that's when syndications kind of came back to life. They've come and gone over the years, really based on how easy it is to get capital elsewhere and for certain projects. So uh, we were brought a deal by Fred Bates. Many of you know him and are invested in his deals today. I didn't know him very well, but somebody who was a regular listener of The Real Wealth Show did and um, said, you know, we've got this developer who has been able to work with the banks to acquire distressed assets over the past four recessions. And so they know him by name. He walks in. He knows what to do with these projects that were maybe half built or just started um, and the banks didn't know what to do with them and didn't really even know their valuation. It's not like a, well, it's hard for a bank to value, to, to value property anyway, because it's kind of based on comps. And when the market's falling rapidly, it's it's hard for banks even to value things. So uh, he would be brought in to help the asset managers figure out what to do with all these assets. And when he went into the bank, you know, he described it as uh, as just walls, hallways, uh, rooms full of boxes. Um, of just properties they'd taken back, and many of them developments that had just started or were halfway through or just land uh, that developers had borrowed money on and uh, couldn't make those payments and just gave the land back. So he'd walk in and literally just aisles and aisles of boxes full of distressed assets and um, and pick the ones. And he, he found one that he brought to me, um, or I should say one of our show listeners introduced me to Fred, and it was uh, tw 27 townhomes waterfront in Portland that had gone back to the bank and uh, were half, more than half complete. They were, uh, the exteriors were finished and it was just the interiors that needed to be finished. But, um, you know, the, the project went, the, the bank failed, the project went to the FDIC. Uh, the loan on it had been $12 million. It seemed it was about $20 million that had been put into it with development and Fred was able to get it for $3 million. So he came to us and said, do you know, you know, do, do you have investors who would want to do this? And and um, at the time I thought I'll find out and I just sent out an email and said, hey, there's this deal, is anybody interested? And we got bombarded with people who were, obviously, if you're gonna acquire a $20 million project for $3 million, there's gonna be a lot of interest, but not everybody has $3 million. And if you do have $3 million, you're probably not gonna put it in one place unless you've got 
uh, $300 million, you know, you, you're not going to just throw it all into one deal. So um, that's when syndicate, that's when we did our first syndication. Um, from that email I sent out, I had a very kind investor say, actually, this is not how you can raise money. This is not legal. Uh, you have to go through a process, which is uh, what we're going to talk about today, because anytime you raise money or use investor money, it's considered a syndication that falls under security law. Uh, real estate law has its own laws, but once you get into securities, it's a whole new thing. And there's a lot of confusion about this because lots of people JV on deals and they think that <clears throat> that they don't, that, that it's exempt somehow. And uh, I just want to make it really clear that anytime, anytime that two people or more, two or more people come together and one is purely passive, all they're doing is putting in the capital, putting in the money and that's it, then it falls under the regulations that we're going to be talking about today. Uh, so whenever you're taking passive income, if you ever do that, make sure that you get a good securities attorney to help make sure you're doing it properly because security law is pretty pretty strict. You don't want to violate it. People end, in, end up in jail. Um, if things go wrong and they violated securities law. So um, I'm not an attorney and I'm not going to uh, go over the legal side of it. I'm just going to give uh, the, a, a very a very simple overview of syndications. For anyone who has been a regular investor in syndications or is a syndicator, I want to let you know that you might be super bored with this presentation because it is really kind of a bird's eye view of syndications for, for more um, investors that are new to it. But maybe you'll pick up something um, new anyway from it. So I'm gonna get off camera and go through the slides, but I just wanna say thank you for being here today and let's do this. Let's see if I'm doing the right, there I am. Okay, so um, as you know, we always have this disclaimer uh, that I'm going to be sharing education and information, but whenever it comes to investing, do not rely on me for your advice. You would always need to go to your accountant or your attorney to discuss discuss it with them because things can change, laws change. Oh my goodness, right now we're in the midst of lots of laws potentially changing. So always, always, always be in touch with your tax advisor or attorney because they'll hopefully, if you have a good one, be updated on how things are changing and they are. And we'll be trying to update y'all on that too. Depends on if this next bill goes through or not. Um, all right, and then of course, past performance is no guarantee of future results. Real estate syndications are subject to investment risk. This is really important. This is really important to understand that um, just because, uh, let's say you wanna invest with a syndicator who has done 10 really good multifamily deals. Um, and so you just say, cool, I'm just gonna trust this person. Um, just remember that past performance is no guarantee of future results. We have had a really good 10, 10 year run when it comes to multifamily. So if somebody has a really good track record over the last 10 years with multifamily, it doesn't necessarily mean the next one is going to be good. You have to do your due diligence on it just as you would as if it was the first one because the markets are always changing. And it, it you know we do think, we've heard that the Federal Reserve may begin to uh, raise interest rates last year, um, next, I'm sorry, raise interest rates next year. And that means that the future will be different than the past. So um, again, just, treat every deal like it's the first um, and that you do your full due diligence on it and on also understanding that all real estate has risk it's just it just does and and to think well any investment has risk any anytime you invest in the stock market to think that it's only going to go one direction is is uh it, how should i say it? naive naive so know that um your your money's always always at risk no matter what i'm you've got to you can mitigate that that risk by doing your due diligence. Um, all right, and while every effort is made to maintain accurate and cur current information, as I said, changes happen, errors happen, uh, even your attorney or a CPA might not know about something new that just came out because again, so many new regulations may be coming at us soon. Uh, so on this, I'm gonna be talking about what a syndication is and the different types that you can do and the deal structures of those and terms you need to know when investing and what to expect. Again, this is gonna be super high level. I could spend a week um, in training and there are places where you can do this, you know, to study this, uh, but this is just really a high level overview of these things. 
So what is this indication? It is, and when it comes to real estate, of course, it's um, it's basically a group investment. So it's a, a partnership between several investors. They combine their skills, resources, and capital to purchase and manage a property that they maybe couldn't do on their own because there's too much to it or too expensive or there's too much management. So they come together as partners and each one plays a role. So one might be the manager of it, one might oversee operations, one oversees the financials, um, there might be a legal, uh, you know, sometimes maybe an attorney comes in on the deal uh, to, to be on top of the legal side, and then the capital. And, um, and so there's usually two roles within it. There's the syndicator and the team. Um, it's, it's maybe not one person, it's a team, and then the investor. And the investor is passive, meaning all they're doing in the deal is giving money, just giving capital for the most part. Um, so the types of syndications that you could do, you can invest in a single family rental fund. So let's say you don't want to own a bunch of, you like the idea of one to four units, you see the value of that, but you don't really want to own a bunch of them. So you might invest in a fund and, uh, and somebody else just manages that for you. Or you might invest in a multifamily property. Somebody finds, I mean, this is, you see these all the time, right? If you're in the real estate industry at all, you're seeing these people find a big multifamily, say it's a $20 million deal. Um, they're going to need $4 million and they're going to get um, financing for the rest, maybe maybe $5 million they're going to need. Um, they might raise that $5 million as the equity and then the lender comes in uh, and covers the rest. So again, that $5 million equity can be split among investors. And sometimes there'll be a multifamily rental fund, kind of si similar to the single family rental fund where uh, you just put money in a fund and it's not specific to a particular multifamily property. It's just put in this fund for when the syndicator finds that deal, then the money's ready to go. Because sometimes, definitely back in 2010, you had to have the money ready. You couldn't wait. Like if you were going to find an amazing deal at the courthouse steps, you needed the money. And that's what those funds were doing is the, the investors raised the money. They put it in the fund. The fund specified what that many, money would go to and uh, it was ready to go. Then there's the private lending fund. This is where uh, maybe mm, you see it a lot when you're getting loans, like specialized loans, commercial loans that kind of don't fit certain categories. It might be that a syndicator said, hey, this is what we're going to be doing. We're gonna lend fund, we're gonna lend money to flippers, right? People who go buy properties and fix them up. We're gonna lend money to them and charge them 10%. We're going to raise the money that we would lend from investors in a syndication, in a fund. So lots, lots of that going on. Land development. So a lot of times people don't necessarily know the difference between development and building. Uh, a developer is not always a builder, and a builder is not always a developer. So a developer, it's, it's almost like um, the difference between a producer and a director of a film. The producer kind of pulls it all together, finds the team, finds the director, um, gets the funding, everything, and um, and then the director kind of is the operations, right? They they make it great or not. <laughs> so it's the same with land development. The developer finds the land, makes sure that you know they've they've worked out with the city that um, whatever they want to do with that land is approved, and um, they may get the they'll get the entitlements. They almost also may get the horizontal construction in there, the roads and the utilities and so forth. Um, that's the development, and then of course construction and building. A lot of times those developers will bring in a builder to build on that land. Um, sorry, taking a glass of water. And then, of course, uh, syndication and commercial real estate. This might be people pooling money to buy an office building or a warehouse or, um, you know, something like that. Uh, that's been very popular these days as well. Real estate overall is like a very popular investment these days. So let's talk about deal structure. This is where a lot of our investors are still um, sometimes confused on how they invested. And this is extremely important for you to understand where you stand in the deal. So uh, an equity partner is where the expenses and profits are shared between you and the developer or the, um, the syndicator, okay? Sorry, I had to cough. Uh, with the private loan, uh, you lend money to the developer or the syndicator, and um, you know usually there's terms on how they pay you back. So the difference is the best way to describe this for people that are are new to this concept is that let's say you and I wanted to buy a rental home together, 
and it's $100,000 to buy that home, and you put um, $20,000 down to get the, the to get the loan, and the bank puts up 80%. So who's going to put that 20% down? Well, whoever it is, that's the equity partner. The loan is the bank, right? So there's the 20% down, that's the equity, and then there's the loan, that's the $80,000. Equity was 20,000, loan is $80,000 on that house. Now let's say we fixed up the house, made it nice, and now the house is worth $120,000. Well, the loan still, you know, the bank gets its loan back, the $80,000 plus interest, but the equity partnership, well, they get $40,000, right? Minus fees and so forth. Um, so they've done pretty well, they've do doubled their money. However, let's say, as they were renovating this house, they discovered mold or some issues with pipes and it cost far more than they expected. Maybe it cost them forty, you know, twenty thousand um, dollars. So now they're selling the house for a hundred thousand dollars, but they spent twenty thousand on it, so they're really getting zero. Uh, but guess who gets? Guess who doesn't have to pay for that? <laughs> you know, the private lender, the bank, doesn't have to have anything to do with that. They still get their money back no matter what. So the loan tends to be more secure. The equity partnership has the possibility of making a lot of money or losing a lot of money. So equity partnerships can be more risky than a private loan because loans generally have priority. Now, again, it depends on the paperwork and the legal documents, um, how the deal is structured, but generally loans uh, take priority. And so they tend to be lower, right? Lower interest rate, lower return because they're safer. And equity tends to be a bit of a higher return, um, at least on paper or projected. It doesn't always turn out that way. So again, it's higher risk, can can mean higher reward or not, right? Whereas the lower risk is generally a lower reward, but it's not as up and down. Okay, so um, let's look at the capital stack. This is the way that you, that generally the documentation will explain how the money flows once the deal is done. So again, the capital stack refers to the organization of all capital contributed to the syndication and who has the rights and in what order to the income and profits generated by the property or again the losses um, it's just important that that's all defined before you do the deal right so on the capital stack let's go to the bottom there the highest priority in the stack is the secured debt so that's sort of the base of it um, <clears throat> again to to look at it like any lender any bank or if you're the lender and you secure yourself uh, to the property. In other words, if, if you don't get paid back on your debt, you get the property. But let's say what you put into the property as the secured debt is what the property's worth. Everyone above you loses out. You've got pre preference because you're secured, whether it's in first or second or third position or whatever. And again, that needs to be spelled out and it's usually recorded at title. Um, who, who, you know, who's in first, who's in second and so forth. Those have priority they're secured and it's registered um, with with title so that there's no question about that then there's unsecured debt that's a loan that isn't um, recorded at title so it's just in the documentation but whatever's recorded comes first so unsecured debt is not as secure obviously as secured debt but it still takes preference to equity to equity and um, and especially preferred equity so once the debt is paid off. Let's use the uh, the example of the hundred thousand dollar home, and there's an eighty thousand dollar loan. That's the secured debt that gets paid off. But then Uncle Bob said, "Hey, it looks like you need an extra five thousand dollars to get this house finished. So I'm just going to lend that to you, but I want it paid back um, as unsecured debt before equity." And there's a note for that. Um, it's not secured. Uncle Bob's taking a risk. There's some trust there, but the eighty thousand dollar loan gets paid back to the bank and then Uncle Bob's $5,000 gets paid back. Let's say um, the property's worth 120,000, right? So now, uh, now you're at 20, 35, I hope I'm not losing you, but $35,000 in equity. And the equity partners that are preferred will get the first dibs on that. So if they had a preferred return, let's say of 6%, um, and they, they put $20,000 in, they're going to get 6% of that $20,000 before the other equity partners get anything. 
So that's what that preferred means. So it it's, again, riskier than secured debt or unsecured debt, but not as risky as the main equity. So why would anyone come in as an equity partner when you're bottom of the stack? You know, I mean, or I should say it should be reversed, right? Because you're, as, as a basic equity partner, you, you're the least secured. You're at the highest risk. Why would you do that? Well, you would do that because the deal looks like it's going to have so much profit that once the debt's paid and the unsecured debt's paid and the preferred equity is paid, there's a lot left over and you get it, right? So that's why people do that. <clears throat> All right. So again, let's just talk about the pros and cons of secured debt as an investor. If you're investing in a, a syndication that's secured debt, we just did this. We just did a syndication at Real Wealth uh, for... Um, for Discovery Ridge for our uh, our project in Park City, and that's secured uh, in not in first in first position is the construction loan. That's that usually that generally the the bank who's doing the construction wants to be first, so this had to come in after. Um, but there was enough confidence that there was enough equity, enough of a return, millions and do of dollars of return, that um, that being in second position position wasn't as risky as it might be if there wasn't enough um, equity there. So debt can be backed or secured by collateral to reduce the risk associated with lending. If the borrower defaults on repayment, the lender has a document saying that they can seize the asset that's being used as collateral. You guys all know this, I'm going over super basics. Um, so the pros are it's least risky in the capital stack, investment is tied to asset as collateral, and income paid is considered passive. So it's pretty good for IRA investors, who want to uh, avoid taxes within their IRA, the UBIT taxes. If you don't know about that, just listen to some of our webinars uh, at Real Wealth for that information. Now, this is in big question right now. There is a bill right now that could eliminate IRA investors from investing in syndications. And we did send something out about that in our newsletter last week. So definitely pay attention. Talk to your uh, Congress people because this this would be a big bummer if IRA if you couldn't invest your IRA in anything but the stock market. It's pretty unfair, right? You should be able to choose what you do with your retirement funds. But anyway, that's on the chopping block. So definitely pay attention to that. Um, now the cons of being a secured debt investor is that it's usually a flat interest rate. It's usually lower, especially if it's in first position, it's usually lower. That's why, you know, when you go to the bank and get a loan on your house and you're Getting 3%, you're like, why does the bank want this or, or 2% on your primary? Well, because it's your primary residence in first position with um, you having a down payment, it's very low risk for the bank, very low risk. So they're willing to take that low rate. But there's no profit participation. So as you know, um, you might have bought a house for $100,000. The, the bank is in it at $80,000, but now that property is worth $200,000. The bank doesn't get that. You do. Um, they just get their little interest rate. So if you're investing like like a bank, you're you can expect uh, lower returns, but you, you get more security. Um, an unsecured debt investor is a loan that is given without any guarantee of payment, performance, satisfaction, or opportunity to return from the recipient. No property interest or security is used as collateral. So the pros of this is the investment's not tied to an asset, but it must be paid back before equity partners um, get paid back. And the income paid is considered passive. So again, it's, it, it has been good for IRA investors. And then the cons, it's riskier because it's obviously not secured. Um, it might be a higher interest rate. Uh, that's the pro. But uh, but again, you don't get equity participation for taking that risk. All right. And the return is capped. Now, preferred equity. This is a question I see all the time on Facebook. I'm in a lot of Facebook groups for syndications and stuff like that. And a lot of syndicators are saying, why should I pay a preferred equity? And, um, you know, it's a good question. Why, why should a syndicator pay a preferred equity? Because basically, as an investor, you're the one putting up the capital. And, um, and if you're, if say the syndicator isn't putting up nearly as much capital as the investors are, uh, why shouldn't, why shouldn't the equity investors get preference? Meaning they get paid first before the syndicator. So uh, at least the return that they were promised. Maybe it's maybe it's four percent or six percent. I mean, some of our riskier deals we've done fifteen percent because it's like, look, we we know you're putting your money at risk, and um, we think you should get paid first. So there are companies that don't don't do this, and and there's reasons why 
some syndicators won't offer the preferred and I understand that you know you're kind of going on in on the deal together and saying okay I'll put up the money you do the work we'll split the profits that's that's fine that's how a lot of people do it but um, you know it's something and, and there might be reasons for that again the, the pros of preferred equities you get a higher potential reward if the project does better than expect anticipated there's no cap on return so that's that's exciting on the cons it's riskier than debt and unlike debt that does not need to be paid unlike debt it doesn't have to be paid back so um, I did a webinar last night that was not a, a webinar I wanted to do it's it was a depressing webinar uh, we we invested seven years ago in a project in Shasta the Shasta wine village and it's been it just has not got off the ground yet um, there's a lot of reasons for that and I didn't know at the time what I know today but to invest in something that sounds really cool I mean who doesn't want to go to some place where you can go taste wines um, in Northern California that you wouldn't have known about right off the freeway you, we see a lot of these tasting rooms obviously in Napa and all over the place but um, very cool concept who wouldn't want to do that and uh, the the wineries were willing to pay more for the space so the, the returns looked good. The problem is, and I know this now, I didn't know this then, that banks don't know, understand wine villages, right? They, they understand warehouses, they understand office buildings, they understand multifamily, but a wine village is not something that the, your typical lender is going to understand and, and know how to underwrite. So it was much, much harder to get the financing that had been promised at the beginning, but then pulled out and then to find a backup was very difficult so uh unfortunately that's uh you know that's what i'm talking about here a lot of people thought when they invested in that they invested in debt and they did not they were equity and equity means if there's not profits you don't get anything and if there's losses you you lose your money like you've took you've taken that risk as an equity investor all right, um, simple equity investor is, again, a higher potential reward if the project does better than anticipated, no cap, but again, riskier than debt. And um, and that's me usually, I'm usually in this position. So I can put an enormous amount of time and energy and money and work and effort into a project and in all of the syndications that I've done, I am in this position which means I'm in the riskiest. And so is so is you know any partner I might be with. So would you be as the syndicator? You 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 know if you are in the equity, you know the simple equity position, you are uh, taking the most risk. Um all right, multiple layers of entities. It's important to understand all the entities involved in a project. Um this is super important because I'm seeing this a lot these days where um there'll be the main syndicator right the the head llc the head company the the umbrella company it's some somebody finds uh, a deal right and then they bring in other investors but they might bring in other groups of investors so they find a hundred million dollar building and they bring in 20 million dollars of it from one investment group a separate fund and then maybe another 20 million from another group and then they've got a lender and then they've maybe got a uh, uh, a different lender, I mean, all kinds of layers of money and capital, like we said, the capital stack. So it's really important, again, for you to know where you sit in that capital stack and what the documentation will allow. So, for example, if you come in first position as a construction lender, you need you need to have documentation saying that nobody else can, can come ahead of you and without your permission, right, because you're in first position. And there's some exceptions to that, like, you know, property taxes and so forth that get priority, but um, and mechanics liens and so forth. But um, you, you know, the documentation should state if there's ever an opportunity for anyone to come ahead of you when you signed up for what you thought was something else. So you've got to really understand the capital stack and what's allowed. Um, but in a single entity, it's just, let's say, Fred. Well, I'll do this. Let's say we're working with one of our teams in Tampa, okay? And and they find a piece of land, and we go, ooh, let's we want to buy that land and build a bunch of homes and and um, hold it as a rental community. And we just partner together in one deal. Um, we're the syndicators, you know, the the Tampa team and and Real Wealth. 
we'll be the syndicators and we would bring investors into that and we're all in one LLC. Um, that's a single, well, that wouldn't be a, um, yeah, single entity. So investors and developers own the entity that physically owns the land. All profits and expenses are contained in that entity. You know, same thing. We find a multifamily, we open up an LLC, uh, we are the syndicators, and uh, the investors come in as well, either class A or class B investors is one entity, one LLC. Multiple entities is where things get much more complicated. And this was also the case with Shasta. Uh, we invested in another person's deal and so did other investors. So there were multiple entities and that causes more confusion about who, who has the voting rights and who has the power and so forth. Although that should be spelled out really clearly in the, in the documentation. So investors own an entity that invests into another entity. So it's like a fund of funds. A fund is created to invest in another fund or another deal. So the master LLC actually owns the property and the investors who created a fund to invest in that, they own shares. They don't actually own the physical property. So all profits and expenses are contained at the master level and profits flow down to the entities below. So you have to understand how it flows to your entity, right? And how it might flow to the other and who gets priority. All right, so we're gonna talk about the different kinds of syndications and one is single family rental funds. This was, um, you know, just pe people raising money, opening up a, an LLC or a company, raising a bunch of money and buying a bunch of homes. This was done a bunch during the foreclosure crisis. And today we've got these big, funds that have never really done this before. They didn't know how to own a bunch of homes. It was Warren Buffett who said in 2012, boy, if I could own a few hundred thousand homes, I would, but I wouldn't know how to manage them. And you know what? Wall Street listened and said, well, we're going to figure that out because homes were so cheap. So that's when these companies were born. Invitation Homes, they now own 80,000 homes. So they haven't quite got to the few hundred thousand homes that uh, Warren Buffett said, but they're on their way. Trust me, they plan to. Um, and 16 markets. And then American Homes for Rent, they have 55,000 homes in 22 states. Tricon Residential, 33,000 homes. And then there's the Real Wealth Turnkey Fund with 50 homes. Look at us just, um, you know, kind of still at the start. <laughs> well, these are heading towards the finish line. But uh, yes, we do have a, a single family rental fund. That's, that's all that is. And there are lenders who will lend to the fund. So they will... Um, there'll be, there could be one loan on, on, you know, 50 houses. So that's kind of a blanket loan and there are commercial lenders who will do that. Well, who do you think those, where do you think those commercial lenders get their money from? You know, it's a syndication of sorts, right? Uh, it's investors who invested, uh, to be able to lend to a fund like that. Okay. And then of course, multifamily syndications, uh, the property values increase when costs decrease and rents increase. So um, generally what you'll see out there is a deal where someone says, oh, there's this old building, it needs work as we fix it up. And uh, as we fix it up, we'll be able to raise the rents. And if we raise the rents, we raise the value as long as we're decreasing costs. And that's how people make millions of dollars. But what's important to know is um, can you really raise the rents even if you improve the property? You know, you have to know what the locals can, can afford. Um, and then you have to make sure that there's not going to be bigger repairs. This this Arbor Village apartment um, ended up having a, 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 it was there was a pipe that burst, and then that led to inspectors coming and wanting everything redone. And um, it was a very very difficult deal. And um, you know it's 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 not always easy. So if investing in a multifamily, you've got to really understand what's the extent of the renovation that they're going to do and how are they going to do it? And, and is it really possible to raise rents in that area? On paper, it might, it might work, but you've got to look at comps. Where is there evidence and proof that the rents can go up? And what about the future? Can they continue to go up? You know, is, is there, are the salaries such that people can continue to, to pay more? Um, and then you generally the multifamily syndicators want to find out how they can cut, cut costs. So they'll look at the prior ownership and, and they'll look at the, at every, you know, all the costs and figure out how they can cut them. Because again, if you can raise rents and increase revenue and cut costs, that's where you make the big bucks in multifamily. Of course, private lending fund. I already talked a lot about that. We uh, we did this on uh, this Challenge Dairy office building, I think last year or the year before. 
uh, just raising money from our investors to lend to actually Fred Bates owns his property. Uh, it was actually Real Wealth Investors that syndic we syndicated years ago um, to build it. And then we got out and our investors got paid their 20% return. And then um, uh, Fred wanted to refi, but the the current tenant was on a very low lease. And, and so we came in as the lender and we get our investors get 5% now and then 5% at the later date when it sells. So again, secured to the property, um, interest payments can be made monthly, quarterly, or at the end of the project, it depends on the deal. Uh, it can be great for self-directed IRAs as long as the, that all stays in place and doesn't change over the next few months. And again, takes priority, priority to equity in most cases. Again, it just depends on what the offering documents say. Land development, all right. Um, this can be a debt or equity investor. So if you come in as a debt investor on land, you need to know what the value of the land is. Um, equity investors might come in because they know that the land is worth less, uh, that there more money is needed than the land is worth because there's going to be building happening. But when that when everything's built, it's going to be worth much much more, and that's where the equity investor is taking risk. But that risk could really pay off if all goes as planned. Um, and then, of course, the homes can be built to sell or to keep as rentals. Uh, you're taxed differently depending on if it's sold um, or rented. So that's important. It's really important to understand the tax benefits on all of these deals, on any of these deals. Be sure to speak with your CPA to make sure you really understand the tax implications on you. And can it be taxed? It can be taxed as capital gain. Again, um, again, I'm not giving tax advice, so talk to your CPA always. But the law, if it's held as a rental, generally it's a capital gain when it's sold. Um, but, or if the entire development, let's say you buy some land and title it and then you sell all the land, um, it, it could be potentially capital gain. But that needs to, again, be discussed with your CPA. Um, obviously, we want capital gain. Capital gains tend to be lower taxes, so we like those better. Um, can you, you can have high returns, but it can be risky. So land development, Bottom line, it is very risky, and that's why banks um, tend to charge more for um, for any kind of development. And syndicators should be giving and offering a higher return to investors because of the risk. Uh, because we kind of came in 10 years ago on the development side and did a lot of projects with Fred Bates, uh, we have done them. We've got our Bates Stringer project in Reno and then Quest Reno and Little Lane, Prescott Ranch in, in um, Montana, Discovery Ridge in Utah, Cannon Ranch in Florida and Co Costa Rica. So they can be, again, exciting and also very challenging. For anyone who's in any of these projects, uh, it's important to understand it's probably never been so challenging as the last few years with COVID. Um, COVID, I would say in March of 2020, that's when everything kind of came to a standstill. And that was a scary time to be a builder. No one knew if anybody was building homes. And all of a sudden it was like, oh boy, everybody wants a new home. So then it was like, okay, well, now we got to order all the supplies. And then it was like, oh my gosh, we don't have any supplies. There's The supply chain is completely messed up. If, if one person comes to the job site with COVID, the, the whole job site's shut down for two weeks. And of course we know that getting supplies shipped overseas has has gone up oh i think enormously i think it was like from four thousand dollars to twenty five thousand dollars or something like that so um, massive increase in prices for materials massive um, shortage of those supplies and no matter how good the developer was it has been very very hard so be gentle with your builder um, they are struggling they can't even get appliances that are required to get the CO to close the house, you know. Um, and if they do finally get the materials that they've ordered that have taken six months to get over here, uh, there might be one little piece missing that now you got to wait for the next ship to bring in. So very, very difficult time. And of course, like I said, you can have all your crews on site. This has happened to us over and over again, uh, where the crews come on site, one person tests positive, everybody has to go home for two weeks and uh, and everything slows down. So again, with our deals, we have a preferred return. So the only people that really hurts is is the developer, you know, uh, Fred and me, because we're in that position. I had said we're in the in the uh, 
the part of the capital stack that gets paid last, right? So if you're a preferred equity investor, you get your money before us. So it affects you less, all these delays. But um, either way, it's just been very, very, very difficult. On the flip side of that, even though labor costs have gone up and construction costs have gone up and materials have gone up and everything's taking longer, guess what else has gone up? Prices. So if we were in an environment where prices were not going up, that would be bad. That would that would mean that those equity investors would be at serious risk, right? Okay, so uh, again, coming back to that first slide, real estate is risky. And, and with development, it takes it takes longer, so you just don't know how the market's going to turn. You don't know where the market's going to be two years from now. Uh, we have a development in in Tampa, Florida, that's 4,200 lots that we bought in I think 2013, and uh, we're still selling off those lots. But we're lucky, right? We didn't know in 2013 that there would be a COVID, right? We didn't we didn't know about that. Um, we didn't know that there would be a housing boom. I mean. Some people knew that because of simply demographics and the millennials coming of age of, of home buying age. But um, but wow, you know that the timing was perfect. But it could it could have gone a different way, right? So the the more the more long term the project, the more risk there is because you just don't know what's in the future, right? Um, entitlement projects. These are probably at the top of the list of risk because so much is out of your control. It is completely up to the control of the government, the local government, and we all know how fun that can be, right? So the legal process, entitlement is the legal process in which a real estate developer or landowner seeks to obtain government approval for zoning, for density, for design, for the use of that land, for building and occupancy permits, for water permits, for utilities, all of it. You have to go to your local planning office um, or, you know, to this, the, uh, city supervisors who generally don't know anything about um, about real estate or development. And these are the people who are making decisions. So it is very difficult, very risky. You could be through the project um, with approvals and all of a sudden new supervisors are elected and they don't want it. You know, they don't want growth. Or maybe the supervisors before were, uh, uh, pro growth and then the next ones are, are slow growth. So, you know, it's just, it's risky. However, if it, if it gets done, it is extremely profitable. So the entitlement process can be long and complicated and risky, but it can also be what, why those developers have the houses on the hills, right? With the big, with the big views and the pools. All right. Um, Entitlement project examples. This is one that I would never do with anyone but Fred. <laughs> it was so risky. But basically, we tied up a, we bought a office building, an old office building in Dublin, California, just outside of San Francisco. You all probably heard this story. Um, went into contract for $10 million with $1.2 million in deposit with a two year close. So, a very interesting stru structure that he did. And in that two year time period, he was going to re-entitle uh, that, that plot of land from office to residential. And then the plan was to, once that was done, tear down the office building, rezone it and sell the land to builders because national builders don't really like going through this project because it takes too long and it's risky. So obviously before we did this deal, Fred had already talked to the city planners and, and uh, you know, found out this is what, that they wanted it. They wanted more residential, that they would approve it. And um, and so we did the deal. Rezoned it and uh, we expected in our pro forma $14 million offer, we sold it for $20 million in two and a half years. There was an extension to that two-year close. So the investors made a really amazing return. And this is what I mean. Entitlement can be extremely lucrative. However, like I said, it was risky if they, if they didn't approve it, uh, we'd still have to close on it. We would have had to come up with the rest of the money, you know? So um, this is not a deal I would do with anybody, only someone with the kind of experience that Fred has of 40 years doing this. Okay, so um, the, here's an example of, of where it didn't go as well. We worked with a, actually a, a friend of Fred's and uh, a 40 year veteran developer as well. Uh, we bought an apartment building in Mountain View 
with the intention of re-entitling it to higher density. Uh, the city just didn't want it. They, you've got these city planners who don't know anything about real estate, so they were like, oh, we don't really like the colors on this, on this drawing. Come back in three months with a new drawing, and then that three that meeting in three months gets canceled, and then you look to the new drawing. Oh, I don't know if we really like that. Come back with a new drawing, and then three months later, you know, okay, we like. Let's go back to that first drawing. You know, so it it was really difficult working with the city, and then the locals um, kept fighting the redevelopment because we were going to turn the 200 unit building into about 800 units. And uh, so lots of pushback from locals, even though we offered that 30% of them be very, very, very affordable. And it's walking distance from Google headquarters. So, you know, you would think that locals would really want that. But again, there was pushback. Uh, so because of all these delays, we sold it one year later than we had planned. I think it might have even been more. And it was right when the Chinese government was kind of pulling back on investing in the US. I don't know if you remember those headlines. And it was a few months before COVID hit. So that was, uh, that did not go as expected. It could have been, it could have been a huge, huge, huge return. And it ended up not being that. So again, title, entitlement risk, you need to know what you're investing in and, and the risk that you're taking. And we have a lot of investors at Real Wealth who are willing to take those risks, right? Um, and some who absolutely are not. So you just have to know what kind of investor you are. If you're somebody who invests in startups and high-tech startups, then you're a big risk taker, right? Because um, most of those don't work out. All right, terms to know. So offering documents and PPMs, these are things you should expect to receive when doing a syndication. And a lot of people don't really read it or don't understand it and they don't take it to their attorneys, they don't take it to their CPAs, and this is where you get in trouble. Uh, the offering document is the deal and it's binding. And you can come back and say, well, I don't like, I don't like this. Well, you know what? If you signed the document and you sent your money, you're bound to it. This is how it goes. So you've got to understand the offering documents. Legally binding paperwork that outli outlines the terms of the deal. And with it, it should include a private placement memorandum, an operating agreement for the company, the LLC or however it's structured, and a subscription agreement. So the private placement memorandum is a legal document that states the objectives. So, you know, here's our goal, here's our plan, here's where the money's going. It's got to really spell it out in detail. The more vague it is, the more room the syndicator has to do whatever they want. So the more detailed, the better, right, for you as the investor. It should list all the risks so that you're very aware of those risks and, um, and the terms of the investment with the understanding there'll always be language in there that says, you know, things can happen, right? Um, force majeure, you've got uh, who, who expected a, a pandemic, right? So things like that um, will be written into the documents that give the syndicator a little leeway for things that they, they, they couldn't have predicted. Um, includes items such as a company's financial statements, management biographies, you really want to know that the manager has experience doing what they said they're going to do, and a detailed description of the business operations and more. I'm going to come back. I'm being I'm being obviously very uh, transparent here because I've been doing syndications probably longer than a lot of people uh, that are doing them today because we started very early and I didn't have anyone to show me how to do this. You know, we were kind of learning as we go. And um, so I'm here to tell you the things we've learned. We've had some deals, just like I said, just hit them out of the park with 34% returns. And we've had other ones that, as you as I've said, just were terrible. And um, and I, it's heartbreaking. But what I've learned since then and what I want to share with you is that, you know, this management biography, this is so important. Um, our developer on the Shasta Wine Village, had he had not built a Shasta Wine Village. You know, he hadn't done that before. He had built lots of other things. But uh, in retrospect, he didn't have a long bio on wine villages. And today I would have passed on this deal for that reason. Right. And for the other reason I mentioned that it was just too different. It was too unusual, super cool, super sexy, but too different. So anything that's just out of the box, be careful of and know that you will there's a very good chance you'll lose your money. But if it goes through, you might make a ton of money. We got um, asked to be involved in something that sounded so exciting. I wanted so to be a part of it. It's I don't know if you know those surf parks out in um, Palm Springs, but, you know, they're building all these these places where you can, you know, surf and uh, out in the desert and then live there. 
So that was brought to us and obviously would be a perfect fit for Rich and me, right? We own a house where you walk out and you've got a, a, a wave at all times, you know, a little wave park. Yes, please. I'll, I, I want that. So it looked really fun. Rich was really, really interested. And also, of course, they entice you with, um, you get to have free membership to this wave park for the rest of your life and all these things if you're a, uh, an early investor. So all of that sounded really good. And then we had to go, oh, wait, but remember, this is not a normal thing. Super sexy, super exciting, but let's just do boring. Let's just stick with boring. And if we want to go to a wave park, we'll pay for it, right? We'll go, we'll buy, we'll buy the ticket. We don't have to be the owners of it. It's just, there's, there's too many unknowns there. Okay. Um, operating agreement. This is the, um, everyone should have operating agreements for your LLCs. This outlines the terms of the limited liability company, including the financial and operational decision-making. This is super important. Who's got the voting rights? If, if, uh, if things aren't going as planned or as the, you know, the way expected, who gets to vote, you know, that manager out and who gets to make the decisions? What, how's the waterfall of the money? Who gets money first? Um, the overall structure of the deal. This is all spelled out in the operating agreement, and I cannot tell you how many times I've had documents come back from attorneys that were inaccurate. So even though these documents are expensive, they often are not totally accurate and things might not tie up. So now we have in-house counsel in addition to our attorneys to review everything and make sure that everything lines up because this operating agreement is so, so, so vital. It is, it is, it's the terms of the deal that brought to a judge. It's like, well, here's the terms of the deal. It's binding. All right, and then the subscription agreement is an application by an investor to join that syndication. And um, and every investor gets reviewed by the syndicator to make sure that they're suitable for the investment. So let's talk about that. Um, how are you suitable or not suitable for an investment? Uh, it is, a, a, an accredited investor basically is a secure, you know, the SEC's definition of a accredited investor, which I don't know where they came up with this, but it's basically either net worth or annual in, income, not both. So if your annual income is $200,000 for an individual uh, for at least the last two years, then you're accredited. It doesn't even have anything to do with whether you know what a debt investor is or an equity investor, or you could pass a quiz on anything I just talked about, nothing. Nope, all they wanna know is that you made $200,000. So that's why oftentimes high net worth people like dentists and doctors are targeted so much for these for these types of syndications because they make that kind of money, but don't, aren't necessarily you know, educated in, in investing. And my father was a dentist and um, you know he, he was always, always targeted for these investments and really um, didn't always, know what to do. So that's why they, you know, if you're accredited, this doesn't mean you know everything, you still, what it means is you have the money to go to your attorney and go to your CPA and get advice, right? So you've got to make sure that you are getting really good advice. And then if you're married, uh, you need to have made $300,000 uh, as a married couple for the last two years, that makes you accredited. Or you have a net worth of $1 million excluding your primary residence. And gosh, these days with everybody investing in crypto, there's a whole lot of these people running around. Um, then there's also the sophisticated investor. They're not accredited. And it's a def definition is this investor is deemed to have sufficient investing experience. They may not make a million, they might not have a million dollar net worth, but they've got investing experience and they can weigh the risks and merits of an investment opportunity. And they have to fill out paperwork showing that that's why that's why you have a subscription agreement because you're you're showing the syndicator that you have some knowledge right um, our definition that our attorney gave us there isn't it, it's a very gray area but we say you should have an annual income of 150,000 for an individual for the last uh, two years or 200 as a couple um, and uh, or a $350,000 net worth simply for the same reason I said that you can afford a CPA an attorney to, and an attorney to review the documents. And you can afford to lose the money. That's, that's a big one. Uh, some projects are open to accredited investors only, and others are, they allow 35 non-accredited slash sophisticated. So why is that? Because um, you might see projects that, that uh, look really great and, and they're only open to accredited and you might be mad, you know, like, why can't I do that project? 
Well, here's the rules. A lot of it comes down to the SEC. Uh, 506C is a new way for a syndicator to file with the SEC. These are um, these are Reg D offerings, which means that they don't have to be. They're not public offerings. They're private offerings through the the Reg D of the Security Code. Um, and and there's this rule 506C that was I think brought out in 2012 through the Jobs Act that was you know basically meant to help companies raise money to to help the economy. So it's this rule 506C, and you can think of the C as crowdfunding, crowdfunding. So when you think of crowdfunding, which kind of you know this is what kind of happened in 2013. It's the idea that you can market publicly uh, the fact that you're trying to raise money. Up until then, up until 20, I don't know if it was 12 or 13, but up until this Jobs Act uh, allowed this, you couldn't. If you were a private company trying to raise money, you could only go to people you already know. So this was a huge change, the Rule 506C, think of crowdfunding when you see that C. And it was the first time a company could just market right and and go to the public but the 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 difference was it could only be to accredited investors and you they had to prove it through a third party like the CPA or through a company that will look at all the documents to prove that it's it's valid or you just send if you go with the uh, income one and you just give your w2 so again uh, 506c if you hear someone talking publicly about an investment it sure better be a 506c filing because otherwise it's illegal um, a, a 506B is the one that's been around for a long time, and that is open to accredited investors plus 35 sophisticated. So you can have up to 35 people who are not accredited but are that understand the investment. They're sophisticated enough to be able to explain it to you. So you wouldn't put your great grandmother in there unless your great grandmother could ex explain exactly what here you know she was doing. Um, can you? It can only be discussed with investors with whom we already have a relationship with and an understanding of their ability to invest. So that's why it was called a private placement. And that's why there would always be these private parties where you had to know people and then you could talk about your investment. So that's the old one that's still around. Um, you can still do these private placements and, and have those. Oh, and then the accredited investors don't need that third party verification. They just sign the subscription agreement that they are accredited. So our legal counsel decides after reviewing the deal whether it should be a 506C or a 506B. Uh, so what to expect after investing? Um, you would get the quarterly updates. You should get financials with those um, and, and detailed reports of what's going on. Um, tax documents for each year, usually a K-1, and they should come out by March. But I'll tell you what, these projects can be complicated and oftentimes they don't come out until after you are supposed to file your taxes. So if you invest in a lot of syndications, I highly recommend that you don't file your taxes until that you know get an extension because your K-1s are probably going to be late. So if you decide to invest in syndications or be a syndicator, just plan on that. Do, do an extension. It's it's better anyway because if if any changes are made along the through the year, um, you don't have to file twice, right? Just might as well do that. Okay. Um, Quarterly updates can be challenging, but I, I want to explain that a little bit too. Let's say the quarter is January through March, right? Those three months. Um, then you're going to be reviewing what happened from January through March, and uh, that takes a little time. So you probably aren't going to get your quarterly report until the end of April for, for Q1 because you have to create it, right? So we get those questions a lot. Where's the quarterly report? You know, they're expecting it March 31st. Well, no, we're, we're, we're still putting it together. You know, it's probably going to take three to four weeks to review. And um, so it usually come a month, around a month after the quarter, okay? And sometimes they're late because things are changing. Uh, it's been very difficult for the builders, very difficult to come up with these quarterly reports because as they write it, all of a sudden something new just happened and they don't want to be inaccurate. So, you know, Fred will come out and say, we've got six homes in contract. And then all of a sudden prices for everything went up and he had to go back to those people in contract and say, oh my gosh, we have to change the contract price. And those people say, well, forget it, I'm walking. And now he doesn't have those six people in contract, but he just wrote the quarterly report. So then he's like, oh, I got to redo this. And then, you know, so it's just been difficult. And 
what we've been telling our partners is look just write what you got you know this is just is what it is for this this quarter and it probably will change next quarter so when you see uh just know that things are always in flux right okay so what's next well if you're interested in any future syndications that we do um, at real wealth you can just sign up at developments.realwealth.com and using your current real wealth login information this is really important because a lot of what we do is the private placement so we do need to have uh, you fill that out for our private placements and then you'll be first to, to know about any new deals okay so I'm going to come over here to questions I can't believe it's already an hour Ooh, someone said they can't hear me I hope I haven't been talking for an hour without anyone hear me okay does RWN foresee any syndications yeah we've got some we've got some so I can't talk about it right now because this is more public but um, if you fill out that uh, form you will know can you tell us about RWN Turkey Fund? Uh, you know, I'm going to cough. Hold on. An hour is a long time to, to, to be blabbing. Mm. Okay. Um, yes, our target with the Turkey Fund, it was an 8% preferred return. And we bought houses mainly in Florida and Florida for the growth and the appreciation and uh, Detroit and Ohio for the cash flow and uh, it was a five-year fund and we went through all our property teams and so they were well managed I know that Tim just closed just sold one today because we're closing out the fund because we're coming up towards our five years and um, obviously we did pretty well on those Florida ones right the prices have gone up a lot uh, so basically the way it was structured is eight percent preferred return and then I think a 70-30 split a profit uh it might have been 60-40 I don't have it in front of me I'm sorry but um then the profits are split so our target was about an 11 to 12 percent IRR and uh that's we're still on target for that so it, again not a out of the park kind of deal that some of the other stuff can do but also uh, less risk right it's just single family homes What's the difference between a syndication and a REIT? You know, I get uh, asked this a lot and I'm not even sure I can answer that, but if someone can send it, put it in the notes and I'll read it. Because um, I know some REITs are, are private as well. So I, I actually don't even know. Are there any major tax implications of investing in hard assets versus a fund? There's, there's uh, so many tax implications on everything. So it just depends on, on what it is. So, generally it's a, a hard asset might be we're, we're building homes in reno right so that's a hard asset however we're selling them we're building them and selling them we're not keeping them and renting them so the taxes are higher it's an active business and it's treated as ordinary income it's active whereas if we built them and rented them which we should have and i i really i just think we should have that would have been amazing um then it would be taxed differently so uh, every every single deal is different, and that's why you absolutely have to talk to your CPA before doing it. Um, so someone said we're invested in the uh, Montana one. Fred promised a return of well, promised is um, be careful with your wording, right? Um, that's really important. He projected. So the the person says here he promised he projected a return of capital based on the information he had at the time, and um, and again here in spite of promises. Uh, and again, not a promise, a projection. Uh, today marks the day that uh, we would have received it. So again, third quarter, here we are. It's January, February, March, April, May, June, July, August, September. So we're not, the quarterly report isn't due yet. So it's really important. People do get very nervous about these things. And I want to be super clear that all a developer can do is project. There is no, if you're a lender, you have more rights right you can say my loan is due my interest payment is due you didn't pay it i'm foreclosing right that's 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 the kind of control you have as a lender as an equity investor you're going along for the ride right along with the developer and the developer can't make promises because a property has to be built and sold right the the money is is not there to give to you because the property has to be built and sold. So all that a developer can do is project. We've got six people in contract. They're slated to close on this date. 
When they close, we'll have money, we'll pay you back your capital. Well, as I said, you know, a lot of these people fell out of contract because Fred raised the prices on them. He used the force majeure, um, uh, what am I trying to say? A disclaimer, whatever, the part of the contract that says, you know what, if something happens that I couldn't anticipate, I'm going to raise the price in the contract that we had is no longer valid. Well, people in contract said, heck with that, I'm going to get out. Well, Fred, as the manager, has to make the best decisions for us as the investors. So is the best in decision for him to have increased costs but keep the sales price down? Of course not. His The best interest of you as the investor is that he get out of contract and get someone else to pay more to cover the increased costs. So all that the manager can do is the best that the manager can do. The manager gets paid at the end. You get paid before the manager. So it's also in his best interest to make the best decisions for you because he gets what's left over, right? Um, so just know that you're not in a loan. You're an equity investor. And there is no way a builder during COVID could be on on target and on track. It's just impossible. And it's important that you, you know, understand that they're working really hard for you. You're the passive investor. They're the active one sweating it out over there. Okay. All right. Um, let's see. Oh, someone says thankful. Uh, it's helpful. I'm so glad because I don't know if I'm just telling you stuff you already know, but I guess if you already knew it, you'd leave. <laughs> All right. Um, can you back Go back to a screen to where to go to learn. Oh, upcoming. Oh, yes. Okay. I will do that. Upcoming opportunities. Yes. Developments at real, dot realwealth.com. Dot um, do you think that the ROI in a fund can compare to an individually held investment property? Sure. Sure. Um, it's kind of like... It just, it doesn't, it's not so much a matter of if a return is better on a fund versus an individual property, it's really what you're investing in. So the nice thing about a fund is that it's diversified versus a single asset. You buy one apartment building like we did and had all those issues with it. Well, you're stuck with that one apartment building and all the expenses that come with fixing all those issues, right? But if it had been a fund and we had five apartments, and four of them were doing fantastic and one had issues, then obviously there's less risk there. But there's also more risk because you're basically going into a blind fund, right? You're just putting money in. The operator saying, I'm going to buy a bunch of apartments with, you know, this This is my target. They should be very specific. But you're, you don't know exactly what they're going to buy. So that's where it can be riskier. You have to really trust the operator because they're really free to get whatever they want because you don't know what the asset is yet, right, in the fund. Um, so, and then as far as returns, there can be single asset funds that just hit, hit it out of the park, like a lot of ours have. And um, and then there can be, so a single asset fund, like the Dublin one, investors got 38%, whereas on our, our fund of single family homes, they got 11%, right? So it just depends. It depends on what the asset is. Um, okay, let's see. I saw something regarding a bill before Congress regarding syndicate. Yeah, this is this is a huge deal. And we I sent it out in last week's newsletter and we'll send it out again because basically what is being proposed is that IRA investors can only invest in Wall Street, and that is not cool. Um, that you can't self-direct and invest in in real estate. So I don't know what's you know why. But we really do need to fight this. And I know there's a lot of people trying to fight it. Um, what's in the pipeline for real wealth syndications? I'm not allowed to talk about it publicly. So as soon as you register at this site, um, you'll get notification. Can you do a 1031 into or out of a syndication? I need to make that a slide um, next time. You, It depends, but usually not. Um, that's very frustrating because a lot of people have wanted to do that. You can 1031 into a DST. Um, so they're they're a little bit harder to find, but you can do that. And you can 1031 into a TIC, but um, into just a share, like usually the way these syndications are structured is it's an LLC and everybody has member units. And you cannot do that because you're you're 1031 into like a share and that's not okay. Because it it's you're buying the share, not necessarily the real estate. Whereas with a TIC, you're you're 
kind of getting ownership of the real estate because titling is what matters. In a 1031, if I had ABC LLC that I sold and I sold a property in it, let's just say it's in my name, Kathy Fedke, I own a property, I sell that property, I have to buy the next property in the name of Kathy Fedke. So um, it's, the title has to be the same where uh, if you are selling a property and then you're investing in our syndication, it's a different title on the property, right? So it, it just doesn't count. Uh, can we invest with an S Corp? I don't know. I'm not sure. Are there tip? I'd have to look into that. Sorry. Are there typical fees a syndicator list in the offering documents? Yes. Really good question. Oh my gosh, such a good question. Another thing I need to put in the next slide. Fees will make or break the deal for you. Um, in the beginning, when I started these syndications, I wasn't thinking about myself. I know this is going to sound. Um, I, I don't know. It, it's just true. I wasn't thinking about me. So I didn't charge fees. I just thought I, I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to take my money at the end. And I remember after the investors get their share, I get what's left over. So we just didn't charge fees. And then we had a consultant come in and she's like, why aren't you charging fees? I'm like, well, I, I didn't want to, you know, do that. I wanted the investors to just get really great returns. She's like, well, you've got all these people working. You've got to pay the, the taxes, the CPAs, you've got overhead, you've got, you're doing these quarterly reports, you have to review the reports, so you're doing all this work and you're just, you're going to wait five years to get paid for it, or in some cases, 10 years, you know, a business can't run that way, you know, and it was like, oh, I, I just didn't think about that, so um, in our future ones, you will see fees, um, you'll see fees in other people's deals, it's just that the fees need to be reasonable, right, they need to just cover the costs so that the business can survive, and um and and so just yeah just know that generally it's one to two percent i i'm gonna i'm gonna create that slide next time to show what a typical fee might be but there'll be fees for um acquisition you know the time and the effort it takes to acquire there'll be a fee to the person who takes on the loan you know if you're gonna get an apartment building and there's somebody has to sign for the loan for 50 million dollars they should be getting compensated for that they're putting a lot at risk right so there's usually a fee to that person um uh, asset management, of course, property management, there's going to be fees. Um, disposition on, on the sale, there might be fees, but they need to be reasonable because sometimes you don't want to see a deal where it's open-ended, you know, where it's like, oh, any fees will be covered because what if um, they need a new car for the office and they want you to pay for their office in general? You know, it's like, wait, uh, uh, maybe maybe a portion of it, but I don't want to pay all your expenses and then a salary to you and like all these things. So you just need to really be clear about what those fees are. Uh, let's see. I don't, I still don't see how to sign up. Did we just send an email? Oh, I think it's um, www.developments.realwealth.com or you could just sign in. Just, boy, I don't know. I think it's just the URL www.developments.realwealth.com. Try that. And if not, shoot an email to syndications at realwealth.com. All right. Oh, what, two more questions. Oh, I'm there. No way to sign up. Oh, weird. Okay, shoot. All right. Well, when you join Real Wealth, there should be questions there. But I would say if you're having any trouble signing up, please just send an email to syndications at realwealth.com and we will take care of that. Sorry about that. Uh, all right. Okay. And um, somebody asked about re reasonable fees. So I will get that list. I mean, it, it just depends on the deal. Like for Fred, when you've got a developer who is working so hard, I mean, they are, they are so busy. Let's be compassionate with this guy, these people, because they are trying, they're fighting over each other to get supplies and lumber and they order one thing and something else comes and and they've got deadlines and people trying to move in and they can't close and it's just been really hard for developers um so they might they might deserve more fees it might be a higher fee for somebody who's really really hands-on versus someone who's um i'll give an example a private private loan you know it's, it's just not that much to it right we raise the money and we do the loan there shouldn't be a lot of fees there okay all right Everybody, thank you so much for being here. And um, I'm going to come back on camera and just say thank you so much. Uh, I miss you guys. I hope I get to see you all in person somewhere uh, when we all come out of our hiatus, although I think more and more people are. 
we just haven't been quite ready to do live events because of this these darn you know deltas and stuff like that but uh, maybe January maybe January we'll have an event and get to see you soon uh, but I do look forward to hearing from you and um, any questions you have and uh, thank you again take care bye bye